So I think it's an, it's going to be an awesome follow up. Good. And I didn't know that Rosenbach had the Prometheus poem, the original draft. Yeah, we have that Prometheus poem from Byron. Uh, that's, that's pretty amazing. exciting. That's so cool. That's one of the things that that blew me away when I was yeah. a kid, uh, or uh, that poem when I was in college. Um, uh, that poem, yes, Patrick's asking from Byron. Yes, it's in Byron's handwriting. It's his first draft of Amazing. the Prometheus poem, and he corrects it, you know, throughout. And um, let me, um, I think I have, uh, where's the, I think I have a photograph that in my, I don't know if you'll be able to see it that well here. Um, when I was in college. Um, I completely fell in love with the Romantics um, uh, and, and, and Byron, and um, uh, which doesn't speak that well to my character at the time, that Byron was the one that, that I really fell in love with. Because, um, yeah, he's, he's kind of a dick. Um, and, a little bit. Um, <laughs> yeah, he, he knows is. that he is. He knows that he, he is. Does. I think that's why he's the best one. He, yeah. Mary and I have a lot of strong feelings about the Romantics, so... <laughs> get ready for that in january <laughs> you know what what fascinates me about byron is that he's also the and what what struck me when i was in college he's the only funny one like all the romantics are dead serious including mary when she writes frankenstein and her other works but byron's funny and uh and that was so that was so much fun to actually that there was you know a, a funny one somebody was cracking jokes and doing that kind of stuff um but um but I love by and I love the Prometheus poem. No, this photo is not going to really work. I'm going to hold it up real close. That's the wall of my room, my bedroom, and it was and on the wall there in red. This is actually the poem written, the entire poem of Prometheus. I wrote on my wall. Uh, I had this weird room in my house growing up, in the basement, and and the walls were red and black panels all around the room and with a silver foil ceiling. It was like some insane room for the people that lived there before us. And I inherited this bedroom uh, uh, from my older brother who was in there first. And I proceeded to write on all the red parts of the wall. And often they were romantic poems that I had fallen in love with in college. And I wrote the entire Prometheus poem. So for several years of my life, every day I could see that poem written on my wall. And then I go to the Rosenbach and, oh my God, it's, you know, like that actual, the manuscript of that poem was there. So that was, that was pretty extraordinary that, that that happened when I, when I went to work for the Rosenbach. So there's now photos all over my floor here that I pulled out of my drawer. Um, uh, so yeah, we have the Byron Prometheus poem. We also have Byron's marriage certificate. Um, uh, when he married uh, um, uh, Anna Milbank, um, we, ha we have the documents with their signatures and all on them from their marriage ceremony, which is an odd thing to have in our collection. So we have, we have, manus we have a manuscript poem from uh, uh, one of uh, Percy Shelley's manuscript poems, The Fugitives, uh, which is about a couple fleeing um, a father who disapproves of a relationship that Mary saved, you know, and, and she, she was actually the first one to publish this poem in, in, in Percy's uh, collected poems. Um, we have that one and, and, uh, and a whole bunch of letters, three or four letters from uh, Mary to different people over the course of her life. So, uh, and first editions of Frankenstein and, and all of her novels. So, um, uh, so there's some nice things at the Rosenbach that we can uh, uh, share. Anastasia says Ed has a blood room or had a blood room. I did, but it was a blood, it was red and black. So, you know, I, I'd never put that together that the blood room that I was kind of spent my, you know, early years in a, in a blood room. So maybe I did. And that's why I love the blood room in this novel. So, um, all right. I've talked way too much just right now. Um, uh, and I want to throw out some things uh, to you guys. Um, uh, Lockie is mentioning this. Um, this is about in the characters in the novel. And I don't know if, um, if we can really get into this now, because this isn't really a question. This is a comment about the gradual dissolution of the primary character um, in literature and popular culture. Um, 
because uh, I don't know if this is anything you guys have any experience with the uh, the Judex character uh, in, in in films. It actually begins in silent films, but he mentions in the 1963 um, movies that the um, I'm trying to connect where this was related to when we were talking about it earlier. <laughs> Um, uh, anybody know anything about Judex? <laughs> no, that's that's a that's a fabulous popular culture character that we all need to uh, explore some, and and I'm just not going to go into it right now. Um, uh, Tammy wants just even just a show of hands uh, of who believes Dracula survives the novel. Josh, we know. Josh Hitchens, we know. He does. Josh, we know. Yes. So I don't know that Stoker intended him to, but I think. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So Tucker, no. So I no, I don't think he survives the novel, but like who wants him to survive the novel, then clearly <laughs> you know, I would raise my hand for that. Um <clears throat> so who is this? Somebody is registered on the thing, but it's only comes up as Motorola One Macro. So your name didn't come up. So if you're if if you are Mo Motorola, I just throw in the chat your first name so I can you know at least give you credit for this question. Um, but it is I'd like to know if the guest changed the point of view, for, if the guest changed the point of view from the novel or have discovered something they didn't realize before. For example, I paid attention when Van Helsing took Dracula's money in chapter 25 or 26. I've read the book several times before, but I didn't realize it until the show. So I guess that was a moment that, did you realize there was a moment at uh, any point in the novel that you didn't remember or had changed for you? So, and rereading it. I may have already asked that. There was quite a few, there's quite a few moments I think I've forgotten because Dracula is, because it's 1897, it's very much outside of my period. Um, so even though more generally, because we're gothicists, we do pretty much anything from like the 1200s to yesterday. Um, but Dracula isn't, isn't one I focus on much because there's no soldiers in it. Um, so I don't get to talk about it. <laughs> Mary gets to talk about it a lot more than I do. Um, so there were quite a few moments where I was like, oh, I had forgotten that that happened. Mm -hmm. um, but they mostly kind of, it was more that reading them again, I was like, man, this guy really is a dick. <laughs> like, Van Helsing's the worst, justice for Lucy. Like, why is Jonathan so stupid? Like, it was more kind of like reinforcing, I guess, than than surprising, but... It is one of those novels, I think, that, you know, the first time I read it, I was like 16, thought it was really boring, didn't finish it. The second time I read it, I read it for a class. It was my second year Gothic module. It was like the first time I really knew what Gothic was. And I read it in a whole different light because I had started with Graveyard Poets and finished with Dracula over the course of like a year. Um, and, you know, I think this is one of the things that we always say about Frankenstein it's really a good novel to read once you've started doing that initial reading because it takes on such a different meaning when you've read everything that came before it. So I think the first time I read the second time I read it, probably I was like, oh yeah, this is fantastic. And I was reading it straight after reading things like The Woman in White. Uh -huh. So this is like the first time. And then I think I read it again a couple of years later. So I think this is the first time I've read it, you know, post, like post, post PhD, post everything, just reading it for fun and reading it you're like yes we were picking it apart every week but reading it for fun reading it for my own enjoyment um and not looking at you know not having it open and also having three books open and double checking what war was happening at the same time and what this might be responding to just reading it from my own perspective and just enjoying it um I think that's been a really great experience in shaping my opinions of the text more clearly um so it didn't necessarily surprise me but I did it's it's been interesting reading it at this point in my life compared to when I read it at like 20. Anybody else? So I don't know if I had forgotten or never even noticed all the parallels that he draws throughout the book they in the beginning Dracula talks about how war-torn his land was. 
And then we jump to Whitby and he's immediately talking about how war torn Whitby was. And he spends a whole chapter subtly drawing parallels between Renfield and Lucy, their, their weaknesses and how they're susceptible to Dracula. And all throughout the book, there's parallels from one character to another and one event to another. And I, I think I missed that before or I saw, read it before and forgot all about it. But just took going this deep, it, it was all right there. Brian Toothpickings has a question and the, like the throw to you guys that, um, uh, and when, and when I first start with you guys, I'm actually going to take a, 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 a break for a moment while you start to talk. Um, something I never do, uh, during, during the show, but I'm going to do today. Um, cause also because I'm drinking beer. So that's what happens in my life. <laughs> um, but, uh, Brian, uh, who goes by toothpickings on, on, on his website and things asks, why do you guys think Dracula, Dracula specifically and also vampires generally continue to fascinate the readers and watchers. So who wants to go first with that? I'll go first. I think, I think the reason Dracula continues to fascinate is because of how much is left out. We were left to draw our own conclusions and fill in our own gaps. And, and we continue to do that. That's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that that's what interests me most about the, the novel is that like I, I mean I originally read it, I was obsessed with vampires when I was a teenager. Um so I read it after I had read like all the Anne Rice books and stuff and like thinking it would give me that like horrifying vampiric stuff. But I had read so many other things that were influenced by it, it feels much more tame than a lot of those other things. But I became totally obsessed with the way the story is told because it's just so unlike anything I had read at that point. Um, and it does invite you in so much to fill in the blanks. There's so much it doesn't explain to you. And I think that's part of why it became such like, not just a popular work of fiction, but a work that gets elaborated on like over and over and over again and gets adapted and built on and becomes like the, like the biggest fan fiction universe that probably has ever existed would be like Dracula and the extended Dracula universe. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of that is because of the, the way the story's told, it, like makes you want to engage with it in a different way. It doesn't seal itself off. It's not just like something that you like enjoy and appreciate and think about. It makes you kind of dive in. Absolutely. But that's a different I, I, question than, than why vampires themselves uh, mm -hmm. uh, have this continuing appeal. I, I, I completely agree with you that it's the idea of gothic play and that the, there's so much left unanswered that you as a reader can come back to the text and can keep on recreating either this story or Dracula or the vampire because there's so much that's unconfirmed even with you know what Van Helsing says about the rules about Dracula and what can kill him, we don't actually know if all that stuff is actually working. So in, in all the kind of adaptations and reimaginings, you get different versions and different people filling in the gaps or, or playing around with how, how these kinds of adaptations play with the story or, or how uh, different performances of Dracula play with the character. Um, and I, I think just vampires more, more generally, they're you know, they're about boundary crossings mm -hmm. to specifically to do with the human body. Um, so something that is transgressing time, um, transgressing what's alive and, and what's dead, they're, they're undead. So they're, they're both. Um, and and they, they just speak to this whole idea of you, um, whatever time period you're coming from, you can bring your own experiences to the vampire or, or to this text. Um, and I, th I think it's Nina Auerbach who says there's oh, a vampire for each, for each time. Yeah. And, and I think it's because there's, there's that kind of rich gap um, that you can bring in and fill in the gaps to it. Um, but also that kind of idea of boundary crossing and every boundary can be crossed, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so I, 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 yeah, I, I think that's why, that's why vampires and, and that's why yeah. Dracula. Yeah, like Mary said, like transgression is is so crucial to tr transcendence. Um, and there's this whole kind of 
shift in the gothic between kind of like conservative gothic and revolutionary gothic and they always exist in tandem you know the gothic comes from a period of revolution but increasingly in like contemporary gothic we have revolutionary gothic gothic that is positive transgression and I think this is why so many adaptations of Dracula present Dracula as a sympathetic character Um, and there's this massive um a theory called the monster boyfriend which is about um female sexuality and female self um kind of self-awareness and things like the monster boyfriend is what things like twilight are a very watered down version of the monster boyfriend but the idea is that the transgressive other is actually something that you can take solace in so like the vampire can be the taboo that should never be crossed or it can be the deconstruction of the taboo that lets you be happy. So the vampire is this kind of, you know, arousing threat. It's the threat of, you know, the foreign other, the revolutionary other, the homosexual other, the sexual other, you know, whatever it may be. And I think that's why it's so popular as, you know, in teen fiction, it's so popular in fan fiction, it's so popular in music videos and film. Um, and Dracula always works. You can take, you know, one of our friends, um, Dr. Matt Crofts has this theory that he's he calls like the Draculas. So he splits Draculas up into sections. And he, he kind of gave this great paper last year about the different Draculas um, in like film and TV and how you kind of separate them and differentiate them. Um, and that, I think that transcendence, like Mary said, you know, that transgressiveness is so central. It's always relevant. And that's why Gothic continues to exist because we're always anxious. Uh, As a global society, we're always going to be afraid of something. We're always going to be concerned about something. So the goth, there'll always be a Gothic because there's always something that we need to Gothicize. And the vampire is something that we all, like it exists in every culture. We all have vampire, whether or not we inherited it, whether or not we appropriated it, whether or not we remade it almost every culture in the world has a vampire figure and a vampiric figure. So it's something we can all understand. And, you know, that's why things like Vampire the Masquerade can have so many different classes, which are the different vampire types, because there are so many, be they from folklore or fiction or, you know, whatever it may be. There's there's an other for everybody. So there's always something that you can pick up on no matter when or where you are. So it really does just kind of go beyond um and either they're super horrific or super sexy or both and people love that that's just an undeniable fact yeah I don't have much more to add because I think Mary and Lauren you both really articulated so well how I feel about Dracula and vampires in that with the novel itself because of when it was written and when it was set, that it's in specifically in Victorian England at the height of its empire with this rigid, rigid hierarchy where you have, you know, extreme difference in class with people who are living incredibly luxurious lives. And also you have immense horrific poverty at the same time. And that fear of the modern and what is to come and some other that's going to infiltrate that society and turn it all upside down. I think there's something really irresistible about that, that as, as you both said, is kind of evergreen, you know, that that's something that still exists today and probably will always exist. And for me, I think why Dracula and why vampires is as you said, that idea of transgression with the idea of the vampire bringing sexuality, you know, and having it be about playing into people's fears for the unknown about the sexuality of women, people's fears or anxieties or curiosity about homosexuality as well. That's all in this book. Um, And I think no matter how much time goes by when you first encounter Dracula, the novel, knowing that it comes from the age and era that it came from, there's stuff in it that still shocks you. You know, there are scenes, you know, on both ends of sexuality where you have 
Jonathan and the Sisters, which is hugely, hugely erotic um, in a way that I think surprised me when I first read it, you know, that that exists in this novel that was published in 1897. And then you have on the other end, the murder of Lucy and how, and that it is also in some ways an act of sexual violence. Like, I think there are very, very deep primal things that Stoker tapped into with this book. And I don't, and I think those are things that will never go away. Um, and that idea of the other and being fascinated by the other and also afraid of the other. The vampire is a perfect illustration of that. And I don't think we'll ever stop seeing vampire stories. Anybody else, everybody have a go with that? That wanted to have a go with that? Good, Josh, did you, Josh O'Neill, did you have a go with that? Did I? Uh, yeah, I think I did. You did, yeah, yeah, you all did, good, all right. I believe so. <laughs> um, the um, <clears throat> I, I, it's something I didn't mention today, and, and that I that I really wanted to hit on, but uh, but the, we're, we're running lower on time. Um, uh, well, uh, let me just put it this way: Did you guys have a favorite special guest? And the special guests were Daker, Daker Stoker, Leslie Klinger, uh, Gwendolyn Keist, Grady Hendrix, David Skull, Kim Newman, Mark Dewidziak, and Christopher Fraley. Um, did anybody have a favorite of those and why perhaps that was your favorite? Tucker, I know you probably had one. I don't know that I had a favorite. I thought they were all great. I, but I, I love Christopher Fraley. So <laughs> yeah, I'm a Fraley acolyte. <laughs> uh, that was, that was pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. I do have a great affection for Christopher because when I was, I can't, we weren't very far into the PhD where we Mary. We got taken to dinner with him with our, uh, he gave our Christmas lecture um, and our supervisors were like, oh, you have to come to dinner. And we were all very nervous and we didn't want to make fools of ourselves. And then he turned around to us and was like, okay, explain, tell me why this is so popular and started talking to us about Supernatural and Twilight and Whoa. True Blood. And we were just completely blown away. And I think it was one of the best. We were all very giddy because I think we were like, this is this is the equivalent of an A-list celebrity to an academic. Yeah. Um, so I do have a great affection for him and I always love to hear him talk. But I think um, it was, I mean, we, obviously we were on with Gwendolyn, but that was, I enjoyed that conversation so much. Um, and, you know, just talking to her, she came to my birthday party too. <laughs> Brilliant. She's just got such a great insight. And I think I really loved talking to her about Lucy. Um, and yeah, it was just, it was just a really wonderful conversation. And I thought she brought something really special to that section of the novel. Um, I just, I absolutely adored that conversation. It was such good fun. Um, so I think I have to pick Gwendolyn. Um, Everybody had a special guest, right? Like you all did a show with a special guest, right? Because I was hoping that that was going to be the way it worked out, and it did at least. So, Tucker, you had one. Who was yours, Tucker? I uh, Daker was first. You were with Daker in the very yeah, yeah. Kim Newman. Kim Newman, because I switched with Josh. Kim Newman. Yeah. So, I love talking to Mark Dwitziak. I thought the the context of the Mark Twain stuff was really really interesting, um, and was stuff I wasn't totally aware of. Um, I and he's a great talker. Like, yeah, it's fascinating. Mark I, just I want to talk to him more him. about non-Dracula related yeah. stuff. I, I, I could listen to him talk about Twain all day. Yeah. I've had a lot of conversations with him now about um, Richard Matheson uh, and, and also uh, uh, um, Night Stalker, Kolchak stuff, because he's written big books on, the, on both of those. So he's, uh, he's got a lot to add, which is really cool. So, so I had a real nerd moment with Baker when uh, we were scheduled to be on together and uh, I came home one day and I had a Facebook message from him said, here's my phone number. Give me a call. I'd like to discuss the show. And I got so super excited. And my wife's going, <laughs> you're just a big nerd. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you married me. You knew that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. So that, that's like me when every time I got an email from Mark Gatiss, I was like, I go down and tell my wife, I get an email from Mark Davis. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
that was a lot of fun. Josh, I was, I was excited to talk to Leslie uh, Klinger too, in particular, just because I felt like his annotated edition has has been very helpful in, in putting together our project. And I, I just love the sort of like playfulness of how he approaches these things, the sort of Sherlockian game that he plays with with everything is very much in line with yeah with the kind of way I like to read uh, these kind of texts. So it was it was a real pleasure to talk to him. Josh Hitchens, did you have any uh, favorite? Did you have a favorite? Um, I I can't believe my good fortune that the the two special guests that I was on episodes with were Grady Hendrix and David Skull, both of whom I are writers and scholars that I've looked up to for many yeah. years. Like I think Ed, when you first announced Grady Hendrix, I think I sent you a Facebook message in all caps, just like Grady Hendrix. Yeah. Um, and then and, and I got a book from him so I sent it to you so because yep. I had already purchased it <laughs> yeah and so that was a great experience and then I think I think because of some some switching I was also on with David Skull which was all, also just a huge honor you know I love the the documentary The Road to Dracula that he did that's on the Universal DVDs and it's actually because of that documentary that gave me the end of my one person version because it ends with that with many people including Carla Limley saying there are such things and that's how and that's how my show ends because I thought that was so <laughs> powerful um so both of those were great great awesome experiences um I think my favorite that I watched it, it it's a hard it's hard to choose between Gwendolyn and Christopher Frailing for me I think both of that both of them were people that I just could have listened to for days to talk talking about this every everyone was really exceptional cool well of the returning special guests I'm I'm Les Klinger's going to be back on the show because you know he also did an annotated Frankenstein which is outstanding and um and it's actually the only edition of Frankenstein where you get everything, where you get not only the 1818 text, but you also get all the 1831 editions in the notes. And you also get those editions that Mary herself had added that did not make it into the second edition. So he's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a nice, complete, annotated edition. And, uh, and Les is so much fun. And, and as I've even told Les, Les knows everybody. So I'm always keeping Les in any projects I can keep Les in because he knows everybody. Um, and then like it was Les that enabled me to finally get a response from Mark Gatiss. Uh, it was Les that got us Kim Newman, um, who I absolutely love. And that was the other great, you know, fanboy moment for me was having Kim Newman on the show, who's Anna Dracula, I love so much. And um uh, and of all, and I've seen Kim Newman in, I don't know how many horror documentaries because he's constantly, especially on British TV, pops up in, in every single doc, you know, horror documentary made. Um, so it was great to have him on the show as well. So um, there will be more special guests and I haven't lined them all up yet. And, uh, and I can't wait to line the rest of them up for Frankenstein. It will be uh, so much fun. Um, Tucker, you've already mentioned a little bit about um, uh, Beyond uh, Stoker. What is it? Dracula Beyond Stoker? Dracula Beyond Stoker. Anything else you want to add to that? Because I want to ask all of you guys about upcoming projects, things you're working on now. I, I'm trying to update it at least once a week. Um, I'm not a web designer, so I don't know much, much about it, but I'm, I'm learning as I go. Right now, for some reason, you can only access it if you put in www.draculabeyondstoker.com. You leave out the www, it doesn't come up. I don't know why. Weird. <laughs> we just search Dracula Beyond Stoker, though. We'll come up with it, right? Possibly. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's brand new, so I don't know if Google sees it yet. <laughs> I love in the early days of the internet when all the like the old people were like, and if you look up www. <laughs> And they would come up with the whole title and you have to do that now. But generally it's just like, if you tell somebody, yeah, just search this and you'll find it. So. HTTPS colon <laughs> backslash backslash. So, so Adrian in the Facebook group was giving me a bunch of crap for using Google sites. So I'm, I'm trying to get away from Google sites, but it's so easy that it's, I, it's, it's hard to get away from. Okay. Hey, everybody who's watching right now, I should have asked this earlier. If you would put in the chat 
where you are from right now, like where you're watching this show from your location. I would love to have that um, uh, as a kind of record um, of, of how many people, cause I know they're, you know, Niels is watching from uh, uh, Niels and Adrian and Britta are all over in Europe that are watching the show right now. And I wonder how many people around the world are watching right now and, and the whole kind of scope of the States. It's nice to have that kind of captured in the chat. Um, so if you guys could just, post just hey you know hello from wherever you are right now that would be nice i meant to ask that early in the show and i didn't so that's okay we'll put it towards the end when everything opens up i want to make it to france to meet adrian and see his library yeah that'd be great so, <laughs> adrian knows everybody too like adrian like people i interviewed adrian was like oh yeah i interviewed him before and you know so adrian's talked to all these people too so as a matter of fact the week before i had uh Gatus on adrian had had a phone conversation with Gatus, did an interview with Gatus. so he turned me on to a composer i was not aware of that i'm actually adding to my dracula project a, a woman by the name of Jill Tracy, who did a, a Nosferatu score. And before I get into asking all you other guys about, you know, your your projects, it, it's not me, right? This audience has been unbelievably, like, great and invested and has really made this show. Um, I am just astounded at how, uh, uh, how engaged they have been mm -hmm. in this, so... It's crazy. It's like the coziest vibe I've ever seen on the internet, like anywhere. Right? Um, <laughs> people are so committed to it and like they're so warm with each other and so engaged with the projects. It's, it's super inspiring and beautiful. I, I was actually thinking about that the other day that I've been part of, of Facebook groups before that felt like people were trying to one up each other. Mm -hmm. This one feels like everybody's just sharing, you know, it, it's, yeah. it's it's really, it's really a nice group. I really enjoy it. Yeah, for me, it's been great because I have not been able to celebrate my PhD like at all. Like there's been no conferences, there's been no talks, there's been nothing. And you guys all being so sweet and congratulating me and like making a big deal out of it made it feel like the achievement that it actually is. You know, I took, it took me seven years to get this thing. And it was very deflating. And then coming here and having everybody be like, wow, that's great and well done. I was like, oh, thank you so much. So it, it genuinely has been the, the saving grace of my post PhD um, kind of start of career. Good. It's just been Good. such an, it's been so nice and inspiring and it made me feel like we were actually doing something good. It's been wonderful. All righty. Uh, and and what you've got? What what have you got coming up, Lauren? I mean, uh, I know you guys are doing Ghoul Guys, and, and please yes. talk about that. But anything else? Or um, no, I mean, at the moment, that's what we're mostly focusing on. Um, eventually, I am hoping to uh, publish my monograph, but that will academic publishing takes a long time. <laughs> so it'll probably be like twenty twenty five. But yeah, um, process is just nuts. So. Yeah. Um, well, you know, things continue to remain as they are. So we will be, we'll be carrying on uh, with the Google Guide. So um, what, what's been the latest? There was the. Um, we had an episode on Friday. Um, Mary did, um, we returned to, but is it Gothic? So we're now on a two weekly schedule, which just gives us a little bit more time to actually research the episodes it's a lot um, easier by than week one yes week <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um so mary did a great episode about crossroads um so crossroads. we talked right. about to it yet. Mm -hmm. yeah, we it. talked about liminal spaces we talked about the blues we talked about doing deals with the devil. yeah i love that mm -hmm. yeah uh and yeah that was really good fun uh, so that just came out and then we will be working on some stuff going forwards. Um, we're hoping to make, so before, in the before times, when you could be in the same room as other people, uh, Mary and I birthed a project called Reimagining the Gothic, uh, which has been going on for about six years now. And that was a conference that we did that was all about diverse and um, kind of like, not necessarily non-canonical, but supporting research that perhaps doesn't always fit or doesn't always get supported in kind of mainstream academia. So oh, we good. did, you know, we had papers about like Jurassic Park and 
Sharknado, uh, Mary would talk about Supernatural, I would talk about K-pop. It was all very sort of like, very, very supportive. Like it's kind of, I think you guys would love it because it's the same kind of community. Lots of very supportive people, rather than trying to one-up each other, trying to support each other and lift each other up. And it's been a real shame that we haven't, it got canceled, this year's got canceled. Um, it was meant to be about bodies and genders, which was going to be great. We had so many great papers and it got cancelled because of COVID. So we are hoping to maybe find some way. The whole mission statement was about accessibility because it's bullshit that the ivory tower exists. Like you shouldn't have to pay thousands of pounds or dollars to get university standard content. Like yeah. learning should be for everybody. That's part of what the Rosenbach so, does. That anybody can come exactly. <laughs> Oh, exactly yeah. so we were like okay well how can we potentially continue to do that so we have a couple of ideas that we're cooking up um so hopefully next year we'll be able to start bringing reimagining gothic digitally in some way in a way that is you know not too much work for us uh, but platforms really great academics talking about things and putting it on youtube so that everybody can watch no matter where they are because Good. youtube is great like that yeah um so yeah hopefully i have i missed anything mary is that is that what that's what we're doing right <laughs> you're the brains yeah yeah I, yeah i think i think so um yeah so we've got the, the three shows that we're that we're doing at the moment the but is it gothic um and then also archive deep dive which is kind of going into some lesser known texts um and then um ghoul school um so the first episode of that uh came out uh, was it halloween halloween i, I feel like uh, I, I that was I, like I, it feels like a long time ago it was two weeks. i'm doing a lot of stuff at the moment it's hard to keep up <laughs> with all my different projects um but um yeah it I, going to the two weekly thing is good because i'm with my really bad um learning as i go like video editing and stuff um and trying to juggle uh you have to do what I do. You just do a live and then just post it. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. No post production. Yeah. That's why I can if, do this. If Mary and I did live episodes, they'd be five hours long. <laughs> <laughs> I would watch them. <laughs> yes, we should. We should do. We should do more lives. Maybe, maybe we should we'll do, do more lives. lives. We will do. We're, we're open to suggestions. So yeah. if you have any ideas um, of things you want us to do, or yeah. Um, live streams then I, I guess just get in touch with us that is one thing yeah like if you guys want us to I know a couple of people had been asking us for like things like mysteries of Udolfo um so you know we don't have zoom webinar because we're unaffiliated and poor but if you know if you guys want it we will find a way to deliver that kind of content because we All love right. talking about stuff like that with people that are interested and excited all right maybe we can and, do, um, maybe we do a rosenbach sponsor of your mystery city adolfo episode <laughs> happy to you know do that and hope we can hopefully we can yeah we are we're also um hoping to get more stuff on our website as well mm -hmm. um which I'm, I'm annoyed that we don't have more content on because it's the the best website i've ever made um and it's got the least content on it um <laughs> but that hopefully we'll have some stuff on it soon um i'm still doing chef of gothic stuff um so keep checking out the chef of gothic blog um we've got we've had some really good ones recently actually mm -hmm. we had one on gothic sound um, which was a guest post um one on stephen um king's um the mist um we had a halloween one on witches we've just had one on um Bly Manor um, and Anastasia is also doing a really great vlog for us as well. So I won't give. Oh, is she good? Won't, yeah, I won't spoil what that's about. Um, but that's um, that's another thing. Um, and yeah, um, I guess I guess that that keeps me busy. What what else do I do? Uh, You're finishing your PhD, which is an that awesome thing. PhD. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to Keep, finish my like PhD. Mary's PhD is genuinely one of the most <laughs> like unique and original and much needed topics. Um, so keep your eyes on on Mary's Twitter because, like, yeah, her PhD is really great. Um, I say this completely unbiased, of course, <laughs> but Mary's PhD is fantastic, and you guys should keep an eye on her because she's going to go far. Well, hope and I will ride her coattails. <laughs> will, 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 will that coincide with, with Frankenstein? So, because if we can get your PhD finished, George, <laughs> you, you get the same treatment that Lauren got, which would be nice. 
Well, well, I I have been slightly derailed this year because I was really ill for a month and a half. Um, Mary got glandular we- fever at the start of the pandemic. <laughs> um, so were so we come- right after that then? That you um, got over it. Oh, good. Well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was kind of just coming out, just coming out, out of it, and then trying to get back into finishing my thesis. Well, um, we didn't even notice. Let me tell you. <laughs> That's good. Um, but yeah, obviously, other stuff's cropped up. Um, I'm teaching at the moment, which I didn't expect to be doing. Um, I still have my um, part-time job where I work with other projects, um, <laughs> non-gothic projects, but other kind of really exciting projects uh, into like mental health. Um, and, and other things, um, other things like that. So I do that on the side as as well. Um, I I do the um, International Gothic Association website. I feel like I should plug that here. Um, <laughs> please do not judge me for that website. I did not make it, um, and I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to get get them. I'm try- I want to make a new one, um, and I'm just yeah. There is um, an awesome but web every now and then. Um, there are some really cool um, CFPs that go up um, on there. Um, so I post them on my Twitter as well, but you can also find them on the International Gothic Association website, um, which if you Google that, that comes up. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, um, cool for, CFP is cool for papers. Um, sorry, <laughs> academic for go. Yes, um, is telling you. I think that's all I'm doing. I don't know, I, I forget sometimes. And thanks to Steve, you know, uh, Steve, who's been our chat Renfield for most of this run. Thank you, Steve. Because I, I quickly looked up like we haven't put the Sheffield Gothic, you know, link for a while. And as I was looking it up and then I went to put it in, I realized Steve had put it in. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for, for running this. We will have um, uh, uh, Steve may be back for 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 the uh, uh, for Frankenstein, but we'll we'll probably have a more of a rotating schedule of and we're, we're obviously they won't be chat Renfields for the uh, for Walton's for sister. <laughs> no, they will be chat Igors or nice. Igors, whichever you want to say. So our chat Igors will be uh, uh, running our chat Fritzes. There you go. From Lee uh, will be running uh, for Frankenstein. So thanks, Steve, for all of that. Um, uh, Josh Hitchens first. What do you got coming up? Uh, so like writing a book, which is really coming along now, isn't it? Yeah, that that's my main focus right now. Um, for the folks who don't know, I uh, cup, during the summer got the book contract with the History Press, which is a division of Arcadia Publishing, uh, to write a book about the ghosts and legends of Delaware, which is my home state. So I. I've always wanted to do what I'm doing right now. I was a writer long before I found theater and then theater kind of took over in my life. And with everything going on in the world right now, theater isn't a thing that can happen as much. So it's really allowed me to get back to writing. Um, And I'm just having the time of my life, you know, burying myself in research and reading about history and writing. Um, And my deadline is in February uh, and hopefully the book will be published um, around probably summer 2021 or thereabouts. Um, But I'm really excited for it. Um, I know a place where you can do a great book release party, John. Yeah. Yeah. Called the Rosenbach. So it would be a lot of fun. (laughs) Yeah, and I have been um, posting the chap- the chapters as I write them on my Patreon. Um, so if you want to read as I go along, uh, you can go to my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash Josh Hitchens. Um, you can subscribe for as little as $1 per month. I subscribe every month. What am I at? I'm like the top level, aren't I, Josh? So I think I did that. Yeah, it's $1, $3, or $5. $5 um, a month. That's what I do for Josh Hitchens. Because I love you, really Josh. Um, but yeah, I have three chapters left to write. And then it's about hunting for images and going to through historical societies in the Library of Congress um, for the next- The images month. are tough. Now, and, and I don't know if you've had anybody warn you on this, Josh, but when, when you start a history book cry, uh, from, from the, the, this publisher, yeah. images can cost you. So- yeah. um, uh, and, Wiki and, Commons. Yeah, and, well, but, but also this is for everybody. You know, like one of the reasons you can help support Josh and his project is because 
often authors who do books like this, they wind up having to pay for image rights for things. Um, and the publisher puts that on the author. So I would encourage people to sponsor Josh, um, especially because this might be a project that he actually has to invest himself in, uh, even though it is with a publisher and you can really help him by uh, uh, being a patron of his account. So, so please do that. Go ahead, Josh, sorry. Yeah. And I, I just wanna say thank you, Ed and all the co-hosts here and, ev and everyone who's been following this. This has been a really wonderful pleasure. Um, a few, a little bit before this started in February, an uncle that I was very close with passed away very suddenly. And he's actually the person who bought me my very, very first copy of Dracula. Oh my goodness. Um, you, when I was about eight years old. Um, and this has been a really, really great way for me to work through um, Dracula and thinking about him. Um, he's was such a great, great supporter of me being into horror at such a young age. Um, so this has been such a wonderful experience in a very, very difficult time in the world. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you, everyone. Good. Thanks, Josh. Josh O'Neill. Obviously we have Josh, uh, we, we have um, uh, Drag of the Evidence coming up, which you are, and is there an end date? Do we know when those? Yeah, it comes out uh, next October. I mean, this, this coming October, so. <laughs> Little, we have a little less than a year for the next like nine months. Uh, I'm going to be obsessively working on this thing and, and doing our best to finish it in the best way we possibly can. <clears throat> but then at Beehive, you know, we have a million other projects coming out and books we're publishing. We just did uh, an edition of Peter Pan. Uh, I'm, your, your audio, your audio kind of crapped out there. Oh, Peter sorry, Pan. can you hear me? Yeah, Peter Pan. Yeah, we have an edition of Peter Pan that just came out that's illustrated by uh, uh, the artist Brest Evans, which I'm, I'm super proud of and is a very unusual illustrated edition. Brest did not actually illustrate any of the events of the story. He used the illustration portfolio to like expand the universe of Peter Pan and find new areas of Neverland and chart different creatures and, and maps and areas and uh, incredibly cool project. Um, we have some uh, long-term plans for a Frankenstein-related project that I can't say too much about yet, uh, but I'm super excited to talk to you guys about that. Um, we also have been talking to an artist about, we have this line of, we call them illuminated editions, where we take classic works of fiction and do these really beautifully produced, illustrated editions of them. Um, and uh, we have been talking to an artist about possibly doing a version of Carmilla, which would be really cool. Yeah, uh, let's do that. Yeah, I'd love that. Josh would love that too. Josh yeah, has written a like Carmilla. Really cool. We haven't. It's not a, a definite thing that's going to happen, but it's it's something we've been in talks about recently. Um, and then we have an edition of Crime and Punishment, illustrated by Dave McKean, coming out. And uh, Ooh, yeah, I mean, cool. we, just, we have yeah. we have a thousand. Uh, yeah, it's it's finished. I, I just got the advanced copies. They look absolutely amazing. Dave did like a hundred and. 40 illustrations for it. I think wow. it's so elaborately illustrated these like multimedia paintings and, uh, and spot illustrations and illuminated letters and stuff. Excellent. Uh, really, really unbelievable. Dostoyevsky, uh, the Russian Dickens, as I like to call him. Yes, so, exactly. Yeah, I love that. Uh, but it's, it's, I, I should have brought a copy uh, to, to show you guys because it's, it's incredibly cool. It's this beautiful slipcase. The cover is just eyes. It's just a million eyes completely like wrapping around the cover. Um, beautiful piece of work. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Just follow us at Beehive Books on Instagram and Twitter. We have a million cool things we're doing. We actually just did a thing, which I feel like some of you all might be interested in. Uh, as part of the Dracula uh, Kickstarter project, we did this kind of uh, interactive fiction hoax on our Twitter and Instagram page where we we had someone pose as an archival intern. It was awesome. Uh, it was so it was, cool. We had so much fun working on it. Um, Josh, you can, you can, I, after you're done talking here, just look up the link for that and throw it in here. I don't think I can find it real quick, but, that, but keep talking first. I will. Yeah, we had someone pose as like someone doing archival work on the Stoker papers for us. And it really fooled a lot of people. And then we had our interns slowly fall under the thrall of Dracula over the course of five days of doing this like uh, social media takeover. Um, 
and it was it was really fun and i think very in the spirit of of these weird ways of engaging uh with this text like like we're doing here yeah that uh, was, you can see it on instagram if you just go to our highlights under sam's takeover under I'll, beehive I'll books twitter, i'll post the twitter beehive like, books we sam's did it takeover. yeah on, at beehive books sam's takeover <laughs> And we did it on Twitter and Instagram as different experiences to try to make it seem as organic as possible. That's good. Um, but it Everybody was, it was really find fun. that. It's really, it's really funny and really cool. I was amazed how many people we actually fooled. I got a lot of messages from people that were like, your intern is in trouble. Like, <laughs> email your intern. <laughs> But that was fun. But yeah, anyway, I, I hope some of you guys will follow us just because I, I love this community so much and I want to be part of it as, as a viewer, uh, as, a, as a follower going forward. But um, it's just so cool what you have here. And I think we'll definitely do a release party for Dracula at the Rosenbach too. So I hope I can meet a lot of you all in yeah. person. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that should absolutely happen. So um, uh Josh Hitchens, you had you had a few words about you know just the experience and connecting with people here. Did you have anything more to add to that before I hit on anybody else? Because I want, I I'd just like to hit. We're running a little long as we I don't, I don't give a shit about running long today because this is the last show. Um, but I want to hit everybody on just some final thoughts, words for people who have watched this for twenty seven weeks, twenty eight weeks now. Um, and uh, Josh, did you have anything to add more, more about that? Or, or did you, or is that what you wanted to say, but the people watching this? So. I mean, I think also too, like in addition to this, this experience on Zoom and in the chat, which has always been wonderful. I, I really echo uh, what Tucker said earlier about the Facebook group in that it has been one of the most welcoming places on the internet I've ever experienced in my life. Um, and that it is like, like Tucker said, it, it has been so much about sharing. Um, and I think that's such a rare thing. And I, I think it's really, really special. Um, and I thank everyone who's a part of that. Me too. It reminds me of the early days of the internet when it used to be a much more like, um, it's, it's a very different place than it used to be. And uh, this feels much, much like going back to like, bbs boards of the 90s like being on a geo cities fan site yes exactly <laughs> any others tucker any final words for our audience not really just that this has really been the most fun reading i've ever done of this book i've really had a good time and i'm so glad you guys been a part of it thank you mary lauren I guess just just thank you to 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 you Ed um, and and to all you know Tucker and, and Josh and, and Josh um, and and also everyone that's just been engaged because just to echo what's already been said this has been a really wonderful experience um, and and it's it's been you know everyone's been so kind and, and enthusiastic um, and welcoming and and that's just always a lovely thing to be a part of um, and it's not something that happens a lot. Um, mm -hmm. I think. Um, so yeah, this has been something really, really, really special, um, I think. So thank you to everyone. Um, yeah, for, for making it so, so amazing. Yeah, what Mary said, um, I think, you know, we might not have done goal guides if it hadn't been for you guys. Like, oh, good. you know, it was I'm something we, we talked about, like we weren't sure, we were kind of like, is anyone going to want to watch us talk for half an hour like yeah 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 <laughs> is anyone gonna want that like why would yeah. people want that and you know it, it was great because it gave us the confidence to do it but it also showed us what people were interested in you know what we could offer to people like you know yes we do this stuff because it means that mary and i get to like talk to each other every week which we don't get to do now that we're not sat next to each other in our office but it's been great because you know we're doing this because we want to bring things to people like we want to entertain people and educate people and bring people together which is like a super kind of like anime theme song thing to say but it's true <laughs> um, as, as lame as that sounds so it's been wonderful because it's been so interesting to see like which bits of this novel people were interested in what bits of the context and the history were people interested in and it's been such a wonderful learning experience for us as much as it has been you know I know we're here as you know the, the academics but 
I think we've taken so much from it and we've learned so much from it so thank you for that really like thank you for having us and thank you for being so inspiring um yeah, it's I, been massive for us I've learned more from this book and I, and I had an idea that 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 I would be able to talk about Dracula for 27 weeks and just looking at the, like the copy that I have with all my notes in every chapter like I could there, there are things that I could go into every week that that we could do but even I was even having that I was still surprised of how much I could find to talk about every week um, for this novel um, which is which is nobody is surprised by Frankenstein when we get, when we had Frankenstein, nobody is surprised that there's a, there's a gazillion things we can go into in Frankenstein, but for Dracula, it is written differently. It is written very much for a, for a, you know, a popular audience as a popular thriller. And that um, Adam had a question today that he sent me yesterday that I, that I didn't get to today that, that was, you know, talking about Stoker's, um, intentionality and in what he was putting together is the kind of things that we pulled apart. Did, did, was he really thinking of this kind of stuff? And I don't think he was. I, I think because he was really working on creating a novel as an author does, but all that stuff that we have found to bring out is are, are things that happen with an author because you write from your, you know, your unconscious, you know, when, especially when you create fiction, you're pulling it out of parts of your mind that you're not consciously aware of, but because you're connected to overall society, to overall culture, those anxieties from that culture come in and feed what you're creating. And, um, and that's the kind of stuff that fed this book. And, Stoker's a Stoker's a lightning rod. I mean, he he like for the for that fin de siècle late 19th century age, he just seems to be a lightning rod where he's pulling in all this stuff that is that people were thinking about and talking about and writing about during his time that fill this novel. Um and I think that's one of the reasons why this novel continues to to excite people is that um uh, is because it is uh, because he fills it with so much from his age and some of that stuff's still going on you know some of that you know some of the, the same issues that he deals with and sexuality and um, even very particular issues like immigration and things like that we still deal with in our society um, that our age is not all that different from 1897 uh, in some ways and 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 he's attuned to it then so we tune into it now and then because it's vampires um that 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 particular monster that seems to be able to transcend any age uh, we find our own ways of relating to that kind of monster as well so um so there's my little take on that. Um, the uh, and I'm gonna have a, 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 a don't go away because I'm gonna I'm gonna have a little wrap up speech for this as well in a moment. Uh, Jennifer Jennifer uh, asks in in in, in the Q and A for a plug, and I'm gonna give it just because I'm involved in it a little bit. In that she is uh, during while we were doing Frankenstein, uh, Jennifer uh, was doing a. Uh, this is Jennifer Phillips uh, for the Delco Library. She's a librarian who works for the, uh, the Delaware County Libraries. Um, she was doing a weekly uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne discussion group of Scarlet Letter uh, every week, a chapter a week. And they're finishing up right now or have just finished, I'm not sure which. And they're going to do a Christmas carol uh, in December. Um, uh, <laughs> I think for every week in December and then maybe the first week of January, something like that. And I'm actually going to be on that uh, in that group for the beginning of uh, the first session that will meet early December. And then the last session that will meet in early January. And Jennifer, feel free to put that in the chat where people can go and register for that and sign up for it. Um, boy, because it would be really cool if, you know, like, uh, you know, hundreds of people that watch that have registered for this show uh, signed up for that. That would be really cool. Um, I also do a lot of Dickens work and it, we're hitting, we're hitting, we're soon we'll be in December, Christmas time, Christmas ghosts, Christmas horror stories. And, and I love that kind of stuff too. So I'd be happy to participate in that. So that's my plug uh, a la uh, Jennifer that I will get to do that with them. Um, but um 
that's what I wanted to hit today. So Dracophiles, uh, before I get into my final little speech, thanks for tuning in today. Of course, we'll post this episode on our, this recording on our website. And if that's how you're watching, uh, thank you uh, for watching this show. We will continue to talk to each other as we have been doing on our Sundays with Dracula Facebook and our new Sundays with Frankenstein Facebook group that we will, that, that, that is up and running now. So all those posts that have been hitting the Dracula group about Frankenstein, stop. And now you can put them on the Frankenstein group Facebook page and we'll save the Dracula page for vampires and Dracula. I'm always available to answer questions by email at epedit at rosenbach.org. That's pettit with three T's, E-P-E-T-T-I-T. And next week, well, we won't be back here. Um, uh, I'm actually going to be taking a, a, a couple weeks off. Um, uh, as soon as I turn this off today, I'm not working until December 2nd. Um, I'm going to take a, a long earned break over the course of this year and, uh, um, and try, I, I'm going to try not to do any work. I'm going to be posting about Dracula movies on, on Facebook group and, and thinking about Frankenstein stuff because I love that. Um, but I won't return to work until December 2nd, but I want to finish today by telling you all how much these last seven months uh, have really meant to me. Um, I love reading projects and I usually try and, and uh, I've, I, I usually try to include other people when I do reading projects, but, but sometimes I don't like, sometimes I'm just solo in 2012. I did a, um, a Dickens read because it was the Dickens bicentenary in 2012. And I set out to read all of Dickens in one year, like all the novels, everything, all the essays, everything he wrote. And I was trying to actually also watch every ad an adaptation for every novel and, um, uh, and, and, and put it all together. Uh, and I did that alone. And I did a lot of things along with the Free Library of Philadelphia. And I did lots of outreach things. We had salons every month for that, for different novels and, and all kinds of things. Uh, I had another Dickens project that actually started just last December in which I, 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 I gathered together a group of people, over 80 or so people who were committed to reading Little Dorrit, uh, the, the only Dickens novel I have not read. I've actually saved this for this project in itself. And we were gonna read Little Dorrit serially over 19 months, just as Dickens released it over 19 months in serial monthly editions. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually, I actually wound up having to back out of it during the, the, the the shutdown i thought that per, usually it's perfect timing you know like i can continue with that but i was actually so busy with the rosenbach and doing digital things and then frankenstein i actually had to stop some of these people are still doing it and they're going to finish next year in june uh in june 20 uh 2021 reading that book only one month at a time um, there's a Facebook group for that called Reading Charles Dickens, which I founded many years ago in 2012. Um, I've done as a reading project, in a sense, I've done two, two Moby Dick marathon readings for the Rosenbach. We did them at the Independent Seaport Museum um, and where we did a, a, a live 25 hour reading of Moby Dick. Um, and I did that twice. I mean, talk about, you know, great bucket list items you can, you know, uh, tick off on your, on your literary programming career. Um, so I've, I've done reading projects and I love a reading project where you devote yourself to doing one, devote yourself to one author or one kind of series of works. And for this Dracula one, at first, you know, I just thought it would be a lark. You know, the novel starts on May 3rd. It's 27 weeks long. There's 27 chapters. You know, this will be a lot of fun to start, you know, do for people. It'll be a lot of fun while people are home for the pandemic. And then it kind of really became, you know, like something more. Um, Holly, uh, Holly Graves, who's been on, on, on our Drac chat and, and is one of our devoted Dracophiles, she wrote me a note at how she wrote that what started out as a book club has now become almost a family. And, um, uh, and I've, I've had lots of 
effusive emails on Facebook and, 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 and through email about how much this has all meant to people how it has enabled people to connect with others at a time when we've all been pulled apart by circumstances and, and with tragedy, literal tragedy going on all around us. And we did this over a book, you know, just some vampire book that Bram Stoker wrote over a hundred years ago. And, and, and to think about Bram Stoker too, researching and writing and rewriting and still having to work every day around the clock on his job managing Henry Irving's Lyceum Theater. He still worked on this novel for seven years. And when it was published, you know, a few people said, good job. He had a couple good reviews of it. And that's about it. And then he just went back to scribbling away on whatever the next book he was going to do almost as if Dracula, writing that Dracula book didn't even matter to him. You know, the book he worked on longer than any book in his life. Dracula was Bram Stoker's labor of love. And, and you can clearly see that in the notes that we've had. I was going to share some notes tonight and we, I just didn't have enough time. That's okay. There's plenty of time to do these kind of things in the future and I can share extra notes with. I mean, that was his labor of love. And he didn't really have any impact on his life. And now a century after that novel has become absolutely, quite literally, one of the most influential books ever written. We gather together during a pandemic and form our own band of brothers and sisters around that novel for seven months, you know? I mean, it's a real we few, we happy few kind of thing that we've been able to put together for this. And it has been one of the greatest pleasures of my life to do this show with you all. And I've said to many of you, and it's true that the audience really made this show special. I could have gone on once a week and just talked about Dracula with you guys and other guests. And some people would have listened and tuned in for a few, but it was the engagement of this audience in the chat door in the show, on the group page on the internet, and in the Dracula Club, and especially in supporting the Rosenbach, that has really made this the biblio venture of my life. And I can't thank you all enough for how much richer you have made my life in 2020. And to conclude, there's a lot of people out there in the world who are going to look back on 2020 as a year of real hardships and tragedy. And I get to look back on 2020 and think Sundays with Dracula, Dracula club, Dracula files, Dracula cocktails. And it's just, it, it just, my, my life is unbelievably richer for all of this. So I just, I hope this Biblio venture gave as much to you as it gave to me. So thank you all. I will see you on the other side. When the world opens again, we can all gather together in person. And I didn't cry during that. So let that be noted. So that was hard not to. So, so uh, thank you all. Josh, uh, Josh Hitchens. Thank you. Josh is crying. Yeah, crying. <laughs> and thank you, Josh, for crying for me. So, cause clearly uh, th this has meant that much to me. Uh, I love you and thank you. Josh O'Neill, thank you for taking this time for all of us and, and for sharing everything you have shared. Tucker, thank you. I love you. Thank you. And Josh, I love you too. Josh O'Neill. I didn't say that. Either. No. Uh, Tucker, thank you. I love you. Uh, I'm, I'm so happy you did this uh, project with us. I'm, I'm, uh, I think you should do more stuff like this. So uh, you, you should do this stuff and I appreciate you. Uh, Mary, uh, thank you. And, and with your, with your cutout behind, I forget it's a Sam or Dean. Who's behind you? Dean, right? <laughs> No. It's Dean. It's Dean. Dean. Thank you. Yes, right. Uh, thank you for for bringing what you brought to the show. Um, uh, I, I I can't I can't I can't 
it's so nice because because you, with you and Lauren, you know, I met you guys right now, and um, uh, it is it has meant the world to me that you guys would share your expertise and your knowledge of this kind of stuff. So so thank you, and I love you, and Lauren, thank you too. I love you too uh, for for taking the time to invest in this project, um, during which you became Dr. Lauren. So thank you, Dr. Lauren. Um, uh, you guys have been, have been absolutely great. Um, I'm getting it right there. And we are gonna be played out by Tucker Christine's pleated gazelle song, Storm Into Whitby. Uh, everybody have a wonderful time. I will see you in just a couple months uh, for Sundays with Frankenstein. I can't wait for that. Uh, Mary and Lauren are gonna join me on that as well. And um, in the words of our friend Dracula, go safely and leave something of the happiness you bring. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. I'm trying to find the with the picture to share. <laughs> <laughs> it has gone away. So I need to uh, reopen the picture. And well, I'm going to take this opportunity to say thank you, Ed, because you're welcome. you deserve all the thanks for this. <laughs> uh, it's, it's oh my God. The amount of work that you put into this thing is amazing. I mean, this would never have happened if, without your vision and your incredibly hard work. And it means, it means the world to all of us, I think. Yeah. It's been fun. So thank you guys. Here we go. And uh, farewell. And in, uh, in the words of Dracula, go safely and leave something of the happiness you bring. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Man. Bye, everyone. Bye. I think now I'm going to start to cry a little.
Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.